I'm Sylvie, and this is The Conversation. This is Sylvie, and I am joined by Taya Prin and our first guest, Alvin Lin. A little bit about Alvin. Alvin is the associate pastor at Grace Presbyterian Church in Chesapeake, Virginia. He has been married to Sarah for three and a half years, and they are the proud parents of Lydia Joy, who is almost seven months and loves to ride unicorns, eat bananas, and smile a lot. Well, today in this episode, we're going to get to know Alvin, uh, which you may not know because there's no video, is that Alvin is Asian American. And we true, are I very am. curious <laughs> about his experience. So our first question is, Alvin, just tell us a little bit more about yourself. Yeah, so I feel like I have to throw that uh, disclaimer out there. You know, my views do not re necessarily reflect the views of my church, Grace Presbyterian Church, and also they do not necessarily reflect the views of the Presbyterian Church in, in America, which um, that's the denomination I'm part of. So just want to throw that disclaimer out there. I know that people can edit and chop however they want, but I threw it out there, so it's there. Um, so briefly, briefly about myself, uh, I am the younger, or I guess the youngest son of two Taiwanese immigrants who immigrated to the U.S. in the 1980s. Um, my older brother uh, is 13 months older than me. Uh, I was born in 1987, just I guess I'm 33 now. Um, and so I, I just grew up in very much uh, two worlds, two cultures. I don't think I really wrestled with my ethnic identity until 2000. 11, 2000, 2012, was it 12? Yeah, 2012. Um, actually, there was an incident in, uh, I was in Taiwan on vacation with my family and my mom, you know, fell down and sprained her ankle and she was in a lot of pain. And I remember, you know, we got back to the apartment we were staying at and, you know, my the way my dad was trying to calm down my mom was like hey it's okay it's gonna be okay like you know we're good and I had this thought of like I feel like American culture is very much just like you feel emotions express it and that was the first time I ever had this experience of like what is the right thing to do here like is it that I should say oh no it's okay to cry or I should say like no you're gonna be okay you don't need to cry um and I know that's not like a big introduction on who I am. I just kind of jumped in, but I'm sure that as we kind of get through these questions, you'll learn more about my story. So that's kind of the first encounter that I had with really, really being like, I am both Asian and I'm also American. And that was, you know, only nine years ago. So not, not for a majority of my life did I really have to think through those dynamics. That's the most interesting take I have ever heard. Yeah. Oh my God. I, I just need a moment to process this one. <laughs> also, I feel like it's a great topic for a whole nother podcast. Like we can come up with a whole set of questions related to what you just discussed right there. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's one of those things. I, I mean, I still remember it's like, you know, you, you, you have certain things in your mind that stick out. Like I have the visual in my mind of, you know, the incident happening and then being in this place where I was like, consciously like, what am I supposed to do here? You know, it was like, well, it was a weird question to ask at the time, but I'm like, no, it makes sense because I think I would, you know, I'm the product of two cultures and yet in, in one way or another, I primarily operate out of one, depending on the context that I'm in. Um, so it was a very like eye-opening experience for me. And I think one that has been a good journey for me, uh, I think, well, I know that I used to loathe the fact that I was Asian American. I wish I was, you know, I wished I was Caucasian growing up. Uh, most of my friends are Caucasian. Still, most of my friends now are Caucasian. Uh, the church that I work at is primarily Caucasian. And I just had this, I guess, almost like ethnic hatred towards being Asian um, and it's a journey I think that I've really worked through a lot of, especially between the years like 2012 and 2016. Um, I think I really kind of came to a place of um, not only being okay with the fact that I'm Asian, but I'm learning to embrace it. 
So are you comfortable talking about that experience? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm gonna have an open book. Yeah, let's go for it. <laughs> what what did you do to come to a place of acceptance and love for who you are? Oh, well, that's a good question. Um whew, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, like, I, I let's say what are the first the first things that you did? Maybe like in the beginning of your journey when you realized that this was an issue that you needed to address, like what were the first steps that you took? Yeah. So I think to preface, I think I I knew subconsciously that I had um hatred, uh, dislike of being Asian. I, I knew that even from the time I was young, just very, you know, very honestly, very straightforward. Um, my wife, Sarah is Caucasian. You know, I've always been more attracted to Caucasian women than Asian women, you know, things like that. Um, and so I, I think for a long time, I just felt like I was on the outside. And I also just did not like Asian culture, like just, I mean, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure you guys know the stereotypes, uh, like, you know, all Asians need to get A's, you know, you got to work really hard, you got to get good grades, got to be successful, and I felt the brunt of that, and so I was just like, man, like, what the heck, I got a B minus, a B plus, and my parents are getting on me, and this random kid over here got like straight C's, and their parents don't care about it, or they're like, oh, good work, and just, I didn't get it, and I, I just felt like Asian culture was really restrictive, and I will tell you the specific moment where I named the fact that I hated being Asian. Um, actually, it was I was at a George Mason University working with a campus ministry called Crew. Um, I don't remember if it was I think it was 2013, uh, but I was actually having a conversation with my boss, who was this like six foot two white guy. Um, and you know, we meet every week. I love him. He's a, still a great friend of mine. And I don't remember exactly what the incident was, but as we were talking, I think we were praying and I was just like, you know, like I hate being Asian and I got really emotional. And that was the first time I'd named that. And it was this kind of cathartic thing to name that. And, you know, he was like, you know, I'm obviously not Asian. I don't know what that's like, but I want to be with you on this journey. And so that's how I see it. You know, we're all on a journey in life. And, and that just helped me, you know, it, it wasn't that he was an, an Asian guy speaking into my experience, but he was just there to listen and to help me process. And so I, I think that's just the biggest thing is to name where we are. And, you know, like whether, you know, I love being Asian, I hate being Asian, I wish I was, you know, a different race or ethnicity. Um, and then I think that then allows us to say, okay, what is going on beyond this, you know, underneath the surface? Um, you know, what are thoughts? What's my self-talk like? What are, what's my internal dialogue like? What are the experiences that I've had that form me and shape me that way? And so that started the journey. And I think there's been many different things along the journey that have kind of helped me to, to make it more whole. Um, but it, I wouldn't say there was like an exact, like, hey, this was the instant where like, I was like, okay, with being Asian, it was a uh, the cumulative effect of things, if you will. Yeah, so to follow up on that, uh, you talk a little bit about some of the kind of self-hatred that you dealt with. Did you ever experience, and if so, how, like discrimination or prejudice against you from other people? And, and what was that like? Yeah, uh, good question. Um, I think there's, and you know, this is not to minimize or downplay, but you know, growing up in school, people, you know, people are just mean people, right? Like we, everyone has jokes for different people and races and interests and things like that. And so, you know, most of the, I guess, discrimination is, you know, someone cracks like an Asian joke about Asians being good at math or something. Mm. Um, you know, the, any of the overt discrimination, I don't know if I felt that to the extent of, hey, I'm applying for a, for a job. Oh, you're Asian. We're not going to hire you. Um, I'm going to tell a story that I'm pretty sure is true, but I need to corroborate uh, with my parents. But so my dad actually just retired last Thursday. 
Um, but I remember, and I think I heard this story sometime in the last five or 10 years, but I just remember having a conversation with my mom and she was like, you know, your dad works harder than any of his coworkers at these previous locations. Um, and, you know, he just retired from the EPA, which is government. And so there's a lot of job security in the government. But before that, he was, you know, private sector. And I remember my mom telling me, at least I have a memory of it, whether or not it's true, I don't know. But I have this memory of her being like, you know, your dad worked harder than anyone else because he didn't have job security because he was an immigrant on his green card or something like that. Um, and I remember when I first heard that, I got super pissed because I was like, yo, that's messed up. Like, you can't, you can't do that kind of stuff. And, you know, I've not talked to my dad about that. And that's just a very brief conversation I had with my mom, as far as I remember it though, but I, I've internalized it to the point that I believe it's true. Um, so it's kind of things like that of, you know, yeah, that's messed up. Like people should not be fired because of, I don't know, their citizenship status or whatever. It's just should be, it's, you know, we're talking about work, right? It's, it's about merit. Like if you're a good worker, you should, you should be hired, not fired. You shouldn't be worried about that. Um, and then I think for me, the discrimination I experience, and I don't know if discrimination is too hard of a word, maybe it's prejudice, but it's kind of when someone sees me as an Asian American, they assume that I work with other Asians. So it's just like, I remember like, and specifically, you know, so I'm in ministry. I used to be in campus ministry. I'm a pastor now, but I remember at one place that I was at, this guy was like, oh, hey, do you work with Epic, which is the Asian American um, contextualized ministry of crew? And I just got, and this was still when I was figuring out my ethnic identity, but I got super pissed. And I was like, dude, man, why are you going to assume that? Like, you know, do you go to white people and just assume that they're working with other white people? Like, why are you going to assume that? Um, and a lot of that was anger and indignation. And he, he backed up. He's like, oh, man, yeah, I didn't, you know, I'm not trying to be offensive. I just assume that you did. Um, but it's things like that where it's like, I don't want someone to just look at me and make an assumption about that. Mm -hmm. And I think some of that, again, goes back to my story of how I viewed Asians. And I'm like, well, working with Asians seems like a lesser thing, like, like white people. That's the that's the gold standard. And any other ministry that is not with white people is kind of a lesser ministry. Um, but yeah, so it's kind of like conversations like that, that would, you know, I'd be like, what the heck? Like, I just, I do ministry. Yeah, I'm Asian, but like, I, I actually, most of my friends are white. And so why are you going to make an assumption um, that I work with Asian people? So then question. Yes. And obviously feel free to not answer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you do not want, but do you feel now, since you have work through and accepted the fact that you are Asian American and you're comfortable with that now. Do you ever feel upset or disingenuous maybe um, that all of your friends or the majority of your friends are white now and you don't have more Asian friends? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, honestly, not too much. Some of it is just, so I live in Chesapeake, Virginia. It's not as uh, diverse as Northern Virginia, where I grew up. I grew up in Chesapeake, so oh. I completely understand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's not a lot of Asian people in Chesapeake, as far as I know. I mean, I, I don't see a bunch of them. Um, and I think, strangely enough, I've made more friends with Asians, or I've become more friends with Asians, um, even when I was kind of in my self loathing phase. Uh, so maybe not so much locally, but like, there's one guy, um, I, I was, I think I'm three or four years older than him. Um, I officiated his wedding last January, I guess, before the pandemic hit. Um, and he's a guy that I keep in touch with and, you know, he's Asian and there, there's maybe some other people, but I honestly don't think too much about it. Um, like I, I think I'm in a much better place now where before I was like, I don't want to associate with Asians. Don't let me in with them. Um, <laughs> Even the church I went to in college, uh, you know, the church I went to in college, like I sat with, it's a big church. Um, it's in Harrisonburg, Virginia. And there's a section where like all the white people would sit. It's not discrimination. It was just like a, a section where the white people would sit, the white college students. And then the Asian college students would always sit on this other side. And it was because they were late. They were late every Sunday. And I'm like, I'm not one of the late Asians. Come on. Like, I don't want to sit over there. Um, and so, you know, I, you know, I, I kind of gave them, I didn't talk to them, but I'd be like, yo, like, what the heck y'all got to be on time. This is ridiculous. 
Um, and so I think I definitely want to, if I was in a more diverse area, um, strangely enough, actually most of my neighbors are African-American. Um, it's, it's not that big of a neighborhood. Um, and so it's like, there's not white people, there's not Asian people, it's actually mostly African-American, which we didn't know when we moved into, uh, but it's been a good just experience just to learn more, um, even though I think I've dropped the ball with really connecting with them. Um, although some of that's just been with COVID and being like, how do you talk to someone? Do I walk through you? Do I not? Um, things like that. Yes, great, great discussion so far. Um, I have like three questions that I kind of want to follow each other because they're so connected. Yeah. Um, and I agree, you know, I think earlier you talk about not speaking for all Presbyterians, but I also think, you know, not speaking for all Asian Americans. Right, absolutely. But more so for your specific experience and, and the people close to you because you can ignore what you're seeing. Yeah. Um, but I want to touch on what's been going on in the news lately. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've all seen it, how Asian Americans are being, you know, discriminated against. Um, it's nothing that some of us from, you know, the other minority groups are not familiar with. Mm -hmm. But this is the current topic that we just want to touch on a little bit to get your take on it. And that leads me to the first question is how are you and those, I know you say you don't have a lot of uh, uh, Asians around you, but those who you have connection to, how are they dealing with the current situation where, you know, um, the majority group is, and other minorities, which is shocking, is um, are currently spewing all this hate and hatred against Asian Americans. How, how are you coping with that surge and people around you? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, in some ways, it's, I think it's a, it's probably a byproduct of being in Chesapeake, Virginia, that I'm, I think I'm insulated from a lot of that stuff. Again, it, you know, I think if I was in a more metropolitan area, you know, I, would, I, maybe I'd be part of the marches and things like that. Um, I think the, the biggest frustration for me is that people are just bad at being empathetic and listening. And, and I use that very broadly. Um, I, in my current context, I've actually felt very encouraged um, so I don't want the story to take up the whole time, but so I had a friend text me, a friend from church text me on Wednesday and said, Hey, you know, I'm praying for you and your family. He sent me the news article of, you know, the shootings in Atlanta. And actually at that time, like I hadn't processed it because my wife and I were actually driving to the hospital because my daughter had a, a peanut allergy reaction. So I was just like, so I don't, I still don't think I processed everything in Atlanta because those things I was just like, well, like my daughter is maybe dying. Like that's more that's immediate. And this thing seems back there. Um, but you know, the fact that he reached out, I, I was like, I didn't even know about this. This, this guy reached out. Um, and then this past Sunday, I think it was this past Sunday. Yeah. Today's Friday. Um, my pastor actually said probably a two or three minute, um, bit about like, Hey, you know, like racism in America is wrong. You know, we, you know, it's, it's, he just did a very good job of advocating for me and there's a, you know, there's a few other Asians at church, but I, I feel like there's some context where that wouldn't come up in church because people are like, well, that's too like progressive or liberal. But, you know, my pastor is a Caucasian guy and he was like, no, like, this is important. We need to talk about this. And he even asked me a few days before, like, hey, how do I care for you as an Asian American? Like, what can I do to love you? Um, and so, you know, Personally here, I felt cared for, but when I see what's going on on social media, um, I just, I mean, I just get discouraged because I'm just like, y'all, like, I don't care your political opinions. Like when people die, we got to be empathetic. Like, you know, I like, I just don't, I don't get it why people can't do that. And even more specifically, I say this, you know, I'm a Christian, I'm a pastor. I have a higher standard for Christians who proclaim that, you know, we have unity in Jesus Christ, but then they get so defensive about their political positions or, you know, things of that nature. I'm just like, this is ridiculous. Like, 
we can talk about those things at some point, but let's just focus on the fact that people are dying. People are experiencing, you know, hate crimes. I put that in quotes or, or acts of discrimination. Let's focus on that first. And then we can focus on this other stuff. And I just think there's people just, you know, it's, I, I don't get it. It just doesn't make sense to me. I'm like, y'all just got to calm down and listen. And after you listen, like, don't get triggered. There's nothing to be get triggered by. Just have a conversation, learn. Cause I mean, that's, we all have to do that, right? We're not, none of us are experts about every culture, every issue, everything out there. But I, I just think in this day and age, it's all about, well, we got to be an expert. We got to say things immediately. And I'm like, I think everyone would be better suited or better or, or more well off if they could just listen and have a conversation. Yes, th that leads right into the second part of my question, um, where, you know, like, there are tons of people who want to support. There are tons of people, like you mentioned, you know, back in the day when you struggled with your own identity, somebody said, I am not of the same culture of you as you, but how can I help you through this? And like your pastor the other day saying, you know, how can I help? How mm. can I help? There are tons of people who want to help. Sometimes I realize that people in wanting to help, they go a little bit too far, like over helping yeah. <laughs> and not realizing what they're doing. Um, and then sometimes you find that people who should be helping and speaking out, like you, if you say you're Christian, if you say you, you love um, and you see this hatred happening around you, why aren't you doing something? And so, you know, I know maybe the others uh, or, or other panelists here know <laughs> how to be an ally, but let's say for the people out there who struggle with, with, with helping, who struggle with this listening that you're talking about, what are some of the things that they can do, you know, to be an ally without over or under doing it? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh... It's not even a question we can ask. Is that asking him to know, like, speak I mean, for all Asians? I don't want to you know? speak for everybody, but to me, like some of the things that I would like to see people do is one of the things you mentioned, Alvin, is listening. It's it's is one rather than hey, I'm gonna submerge, immerse myself into your culture for like five days and then see what you go through. You know that kind of thing is a bit much. But with what's going on, what are some of the things that we can? help any one of you guys can chime in here too to to help with that like how can how can people help rather than just be bystanders yeah that's 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 a good question yeah i, I mean i i just I, I think the biggest thing for me is just to listen listen and to love um you know i think the the big challenge that exists in America right now is that there's this belief that if you support something, you have to go all out for it. So it's like, okay, if you really love Asian people, you got to go to all the marches. You got to only buy food from Asian people and all these different kinds of things. And yeah, you know, I like Asian food. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm Chinese. I love Chinese food, but like, and I, I recognize why people say that, but I think also people tend to everyone wants to control everyone else's conscience. But if we're honest, there are hundreds of issues in America that you, anyone can make an argue for, like, you should be very passionate about this. And I'm just like, that's just unrealistic. Like, we can't do everything. Like, we, we can't. And so I just think the listening piece and being a friend, asking questions, you know, and it starts with, yeah, how can I love you and support you? Um, you know, I'm not an expert on it. But you know, I, I know when you know, all the different shootings and the murders last year for the black community, you know, I, I would reach out to my black friends and just text them and say, hey, like, I love you. I'm praying for you. Is there anything I can do for you? Um, and, you know, they, they weren't local per se. They were friends that I've known for a while, but I think people just want to be seen, right? That's the biggest thing is people in these times, right? I, I think it's, we want you to see us. We want you to see that there's a problem here. You might not agree with all the politics behind it, but if we feel seen, that at least helps us to feel human, right? Because that's what it's about at the end of the day is, do we feel human or do we feel less than human and think that we have to do something in order to, I guess, quote unquote, earn our humanity? And we live in a world right now where it is 
so easy for you to lose your humanity in someone else's eyes, mm. and but they won't admit that you are no longer human to them. You know, they'll just yeah. play it off like they're still respecting you. And it's like, no, you aren't treating me like I am a human worth anything. You are treating me like I am worthless. And mm. if we if we got back to basic love and respect and empathy, we'd be in such a different place. And I feel like we've just lost our ability to moderate ourselves. Like mm. you said, Alvin, it's just one extreme or the other extreme. You have to go all in and support this. One of my friends um, was upset because she couldn't attend a Black Lives Matter march because she's immunocompromised. And it was like, just because you, you are going to put, you're putting yourself into a bad situation by going to this march. No one's saying that you don't support black people. We're saying be healthy. You don't need to feel guilty about that, mm. but we live in a society where if you don't go to all the marches, you don't support black people. If you aren't buying from these Asian restaurants, you don't support Asian people. Yeah. And you're not there for Asian solidarity. And it's like, we need to find our balance again. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's exactly where I was going. You know, the humanity of all things. There's some things that are very explicit that you can help in. For example, the most recent video I saw where this gentleman was beating up on a woman in front of a store, an, an Asian American woman. The woman fell and was just sitting there for several minutes. And the store, the employees of the store shut the door. Mm. And I'm like, that is such a simple way you can, you know, render some kind of kindness by opening the door and pull the woman inside or something like that to prevent Even her showing from showing that your presence. Just go nice. out there. You know, <laughs> if there, there were gunshots, I understand, you know, like you can get hurt. I'm not saying putting yourself in a dangerous situation, but the, the perp had already gone and the woman sitting on the ground and they closed the door. Mm -hmm. And that shows that we have stripped ourselves of all humanity if we can't help. If we're gonna look at somebody's color, ethnicity and say, oh, this is an Asian American and this is an African American or this is, Caucasian, this is a Caucasian American, I'm not gonna help this person because, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I heard people say during the during the riot at the white at, at, at the capitol oh that's white on white crime and i'm like come on people stop it you Even know this asian stuff i've heard black you know? people be like well asians are racist so who cares what <laughs> get back to humanity get back to the point where you're going to say that's a human life that how can i help regardless of ethnicity regardless of you know, how can I love that ground? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, and I just think it's, I don't know, I feel like the social media, we just need to get rid of it, right? It doesn't help anything. It's never like, you know, how many people's minds have been changed through social media ever? It's just, you're either in an echo chamber, or you always have someone who opposes what you say, but they're not actually trying to get into a dialogue with you. They're just there to voice their opposition or disagreement with what you say and so you know I just and we do it all the time you know to your point about humanity like you're not even talking about matters of race but it's so easy to dehumanize someone when we think about them you know I do it you know when I'm angry at someone or frustrated or bitter you know I just am like what the heck you know this is not a person but then when I see this person face to face I'm like oh my goodness I can't believe in my heart that I was hating this person this is a human being and so I think we got to get in front of other people and have those conversations. But the problem is, you know, this is not happening. I think we also don't really know how to face our emotions, mm. negative emotions. Yeah. So have that conversation. Absolutely. Yeah, I was going to say, Alvin, just to kind of tie this together, when you think about your racial background and also specifically your faith and your ministry that you're involved mm -hmm. with. How does that all come together or does it, is it compartmentalized? Is it interwoven? Do these things affect that? Um, I think if I'm understanding your question correctly, I mean, I, I think it's, we, you know, 
we have to be um, um, we're we're integrated, right? Like we're integrated beings um, in in so many different ways that it's easy to overlook that. You know, some people overplay the I guess the spiritual side. They're like, no, you're a soul. You just have a body. Other people overplay the materialistic side. Oh, you know, you're just a body. There's no such thing as a soul. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just think like, and I just think Jesus knew what was up, right? He said, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, Jesus knew what was up. That makes a complete sense. Like, so when I think about it, it's like, how do I, whoever I'm meeting with, doesn't matter if they're an adult, doesn't matter if they're a kid, doesn't matter if they're white, black, Asian, uh, doesn't matter socioeconomic status. My thing is like, how can I, how do I love this person right now? Like that just shapes all of my ministry. And I just, I mean, I remember people asking me about ministry years ago and they're like, you know, how do you kind of sum up ministry? I'm like, it's just, you love people. Like you love people. And like, with that being said, love is not always making people feel good. Like lest, lest that come off that way, right? Because a lot of times it's like, well, if you love me, you'll let me do what I want. And it's like, well, no, like we're just, I believe we're sinful people. We're destructive people. We don't always make good decisions. And if someone actually loves me, they're going to say, yo, don't do that thing. Cause that's not actually wise. Um, and so, you know, in, in my current context, it's mainly, uh, again, mainly Caucasian. Uh, I mean, it's probably 99% Caucasian in my church, but you know, I, I pick my places to point out, you know, to talk about these current events, um, you know, whether last year and all the different shootings and deaths, you know, I remember at a youth group meeting, I was like, Hey, you know, like, I want to briefly talk about race for five minutes. Like, I don't care your political belief. I think though, you can see that if you look at the news, if you look at our culture, our history, that there has been racism towards black people. Like, let's just all agree on that. Like it's, it sounds so, it sounds so like pointless to say, but it's like, no, we got to establish the baseline because people fight against the baseline right now. Um, or, you know, I can say to people, yeah, you know, it's been a, it's been a difficult week. I'm still processing everything that was going on in Atlanta. Um, and, and I do think this going along with empathy, I just had this thought. Um, it's important to think through um, both uh, intent and perception. Because I think in, where people get hung up is they say, oh, it wasn't my intent to discriminate or I'm not a racist. I don't have that intent. And yet I think perception is part of that piece of, you know, if I think we've lost Allison. I just want to give him a minute. Experiencing some technical difficulties. Yeah, so, you know, I just think it's important for people to think through the difference um, between um, intent and perception. I think these days people, it's easy to really focus on, well, it's not my intent to discriminate or to have prejudice or, you know, I don't have any, you know, they, they say I don't have any discrimination or prejudice, which may or may not be true. But I think people have to recognize that perception matters, um, especially in difficult times like this, where, you know, whatever, I mean, I just think it doesn't matter what race you are, or whatever the current events may be. Um, if we say, oh, you know, wasn't my intent to be that way, like, you know, you shouldn't be so offended. Um, that actually doesn't help any dialogue. Um, you know, and again, I, I recognize that there are people have different standards as to where that line should be. You know, I, is being offended, you know, is that the ultimate wrong in the world? I, it's not. And yet I think in times of mourning or grief or fear, it's not helpful to say, well, you know, it wasn't, you know, like in the, in the case of the Atlanta shootings, like, I don't know if that guy was racist or not. I, I don't know. I can't say explicitly. Right. But regardless of his intent, the way that people experience it, perception is that there might have been racial motivations, or it just makes Asian people scared, regardless of his intent. And so I think that's why it's important for us to think through those things. Yes, the facts matter, but it also matters how people communicate and talk about things. Um, and in the same way, you know, if you're having a conversation with a friend and they're trying to, you know, convince you of something and they just start cussing at you a bunch, like, is that actually going to make you listen? No. 
But if you make a reasoned argument and you engage with them where they are and you're empathetic and all those different kinds of things, yeah, they, they might actually listen to you. So I just think that's really helpful for people to consider. But again, it's lost in this age where everything's on social media. And I just think people, one, people don't think about what they post. Two, social media is the worst because you have no tone of voice. And three, everything is so polarized right now that it's impossible to have constructive conversation. Yeah, thank you for sharing so much of that. Um, and it's been really, really valuable. Before we conclude, I just want to leave this open for you to tell us whether we've discussed it or not, uh, what are some of the final thoughts you'd like to leave us in the audience with? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I'll say two. I'll say that I think there's two two main thoughts. I think one, I think the the battle these days or the struggle these days is it's all about terms. People are trying to redefine things. Um, and so I will I will say something that people might not like, but um, you know, there's a big debate or argument over critical race theory. Uh, admittedly, I've not done a lot of research on it, um, but it's all about language there. And so, you know, people talk about microaggressions and I actually don't like that word because I'm like, what is a microaggression? We're, you know, we're trying to get people to think the same way. And yet we can say prejudice, we can say discrimination. Maybe some of the thought behind that is, well, people don't think they're, you know, prejudiced or whatever. Um, but strangely enough, microaggressions seem more aggressive to me than just saying prejudice. Um, and so, you know, I don't, I don't use that language, at least I haven't right now, because I, I don't fully understand it. But I also think that when you're using different terms that you have to educate people on, it's not the best conversation piece. And so I, I really do think a lot of the discussions and the debates that are happening these days are because people are using different language and they're not, you know, operating on the same page. Um, and then secondly, you know, I, I think my, my encouragement to everyone, and this is not just an Asian thing, but I think it's important for us to see at how culture, American culture in particular, although you can make the argument for any other culture, um, portrays people of different ethnicities. You know, I just remember a long time ago, I was talking to my old pastor uh, who was um, Asian American. And he was like, you know, if you think on a spectrum of most aggressive to most passive, and then you also, like for gender, if you think most aggressive to most passive, you would say, okay, males, men are more aggressive than women. But then if you slot in different races in between then, you would say, you know, that the Asian male is probably the, is viewed as the most passive. And you might, you, you might say that the the black male is viewed as the most aggressive. And even, you know, you can intersperse men and women into that. And I just think that that reality is true. Like you look at movies, you look at media, you look at how people talk. And so it's just helpful for people to recognize that we are all humans and yet we are still predisposed to treat people a certain way. I think because of that spectrum, whether or not we know it, these messages are being pushed out to us. And it's important for us to recognize that those realities exist. Otherwise, you know, we'll just, be sub, you know, subconsciously doing these things without recognizing it. Yeah, that's well said. Well, Alvin, on behalf of Taya Prin, thank you very much for coming and, and being our first guest. Uh, I think I speak for all of us when I say this has been a really great experience and we uh, plan to have more guests on and if you're willing to have you on again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I apologize for my technical difficulties. I guess the power in my house finally just got kicked on. But yeah, I mean, if there's anything that y'all um, want, you know, follow up with me on or if there's a question that just kind of want me to, you know, I don't mind doing a recording of just myself, you know, answering questions or, you know, giving a talk, whatever. Um, I'm not an expert, but I, I think I'm always willing to learn and to engage. Well, I'm Sylvie, and this is The Conversation. Mm -hmm.